thank you. So, so most of you have, have uh, interpreted that there is a difference between these two wines. So it begs the question, what has caused this difference? Let me tell you what, what you've been drinking. There are two bottles of wine from the village of Azé, which is in Burgundy, in France. They are both made in the same year. They're both made from the same grape, the Chardonnay grape. They're both made in the same way. And yet, you've told me, most of you have told me, they taste different. What most people in France would tell you, in terms of the reason for that, is terroir. And in this case, these two wines come from different parts of the village of Azé. The first wine, wine A, comes from vineyards mostly in the west of the village. The second wine, wine B, comes mostly from vineyards in the north of the village. That is approximate. And I will tell you why it's approximate later. So terroir makes a difference. We've tried to keep a fair test, and we've seen that there's a difference between these two wines. They come from two different places, so there's kind of a logical proposition that terroir might lie behind that. On the website of the cooperative winery of Azé, uh, which made this wine, they have a section all about... Oh. They have a section all about terroir. They describe notre terroir, our terroir. And they talk about what makes it up. They talk about the physical geography of the village and the vineyards that are there. They talk about the microclimate. They talk about the history of wine production in that area. And they talk about the tasks that the wine producers use throughout the year in the different seasons. And all of this for them comes together under the heading of terroir. It's the sense of place. It's what makes the wine what it is. It's what connects the product to the place of origin. There are many different approaches we could take to terroir. Looking at a landscape like this is a kind of picnic for the environmental humanities because it's made up of layers of cultural and physical stuff, right? And it has a history. Terroir itself um, comes from the same Latin root in French as uh, terre and terrain and territoire. That is to say, uh, ground, soil, terrain, territory. 200 years ago, um, gastronomic maps of the country started to be made where people attempted to show the, the bounty of food and drink available throughout the country. They showed uh, barrels of wine, they showed champagne corks popping, they showed chickens, they showed fish, they showed cheese. And 100 years later, this reached kind of epic proportions where you'd have over a thousand products inscribed on the land of France. Wines, cheeses, other products. France is a diverse, bountiful land. And its soil is covered and used for different agricultural purposes. I'm not going to go into detail about this map, but the colors refer to what the land lies under, whether that's pasture, whether that's wheat, whether that's grapevines. And I just want to point to, in Burgundy, there is a purple strip running down the middle, which is land planted in grapevines. When I went to Burgundy a few years ago on my doctoral fieldwork, I asked the wine producers, qu'évoque le mot terroir pour vous? What does terroir mean to you? And I took their responses and I put them in a blender and I made a word cloud. So the most frequent things, there are many, there are many words that came up which show something about the, the polyvocality, the multiple meanings of the concept, but some of them appeared more often uh, than others, and, and they're bigger. And, I'm sorry, these, these are all in French, I haven't translated this. So appellation is one of them. Appellation refers to labels, labels of geographic origin. That is explicitly a connection to terroir, a connection between a product that you might find in a supermarket and the place that it comes from. Another important one was le goût, taste, the idea that the taste of the wine can be ascribed to terroir. This is what the producers were telling me. C'est un goût de terroir, it's a taste of the terroir. But by far the most common was le sol, the soil. And as I've already mentioned, the soil is a repository of physical stuff, which we can use scientific approaches to understand, and layers of cultural meaning. Now, terroir is far from the only concept and France very far from the only place which thinks that the place of origin of a wine is important. If we go back to the ancient world, we know that even in um, ancient Egypt, it was the habit for the elites to label jars of commodities with the place of origin, with the year of production, and what was in it. And this is actually a, a hieratic jar from Upper Egypt, 1400 BC. This contained fat, and they labeled it, they labeled it um, accordingly. The ancient Greeks spread wine culture throughout the coast of the Mediterranean, and the Romans took the baton from them. 
This mosaic of the grape harvest comes from Cherchel in present-day Algeria, back when it was a Roman colony and used to produce wine. Gibbon, in his history of the, the end of the Roman Empire, tells us that in northern Europe, people could make beer. While the Romans were doing their thing, people could make beer to make merry. But once they had a taste of the rich wines of Italy and afterwards of Gaul, which is France, they sighed for that more delicious species of intoxication. <laughs> The Christian monastic tradition took the civilization of wine from the Dark Ages through to the medieval period. And they enjoyed climatically uh, the fruits of the medieval warm period from 950 AD to about 1250. During that time, there was an explosion in the number of monasteries throughout Europe, and they were often planted all around with grapevines. Sometimes they would describe, they were sensitive to the aesthetic uh, side of this, and they would describe it as a kind of paradise amongst fertile vines. The, uh, the Abbey of Cluny, uh, which was founded, I think, the 11th century, uh, they planted a lot of land under grapevines, and the monks took the time, and they had the patience, to see which areas would produce grapes that made the finest wine. The climate in Burgundy, although it was warm, it was still uncertain. It's quite far north in France. So they were the ones who had the land and the time, and also the motivation, which I'll mention in a moment, to look at where wine could be made best. The motivation... So, on the one hand, within the Christian religion, we need wine for the mass, right? Secondly, uh, the monks need it for their personal consumption. And thirdly, they need it for the, the arrival of pilgrims and um, notable characters from elsewhere in the church and kings and princes. They have a duty of hospitality which wine enables them to fulfill. At Cluny, in the 13th century, over a period of 20 years, they had passed through their doors Pope Innocent IV, the King of France, the Queen Mother, sons of the Kings of Spain, the Emperor of Constantinople. They had all these dignitaries that came along and they wanted to offer them their best wine because in the future they might be able to curry favour with these powerful leaders and they also had lesser wines for day-to-day -day consumption. The monks of Burgundy, the Cistercians in the north and the, Bened the Benedictines from Cluny in the south are responsible for planting much of the region under grapevines and some of those vineyards are still in use today. It's an important part of the creation story. Now, the Dukes of Burgundy would take wine and they would ship it south to the popes at Avignon in Rome, but they would also start to ship it north in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries to the growing commercial cities of northern Europe, the Hanseatic ports, places where there's a taste for wine and the money to buy it. So by the 18th century, wine moves from the symbolic economy to the capitalist economy. Adam Smith tells us in his Wealth of Nations that there are wines that come from vineyards of a peculiarly happy soil and situation which command a price out of, out of, um, out of balance with the other, the other vineyards nearby. So this is like an, an inchoative idea of terroir that certain vineyards are already getting a reputation. We know that wine that comes from there is good and it's valuable. Wine was enjoyed... Sorry. Wine was enjoyed by the elites uh, champagne grew in popularity and it passed through all the courts of Europe in the 18th century. The philosopher Hume describes champagne wine and burgundy wine as luxuries that could be part of uh, a good moral standing in society. It doesn't have to be drunkenness, which is bad. You can also enjoy luxuries sparingly, and in that, in that circumstance, alcohol is good. And there was an errant abbot who found himself in England at the start of the 18th century by the name of Arnu, and he drew up a map for the English who were kind of becoming fascinated uh, by the wines of Burgundy. He drew up a map of the various villages and even individual vineyards where great wines were to be found. And in his text, he makes one of the first mentions of terroir. He says it's terroir that makes these wines great, and terroirs vary throughout the Burgundy region. And he also used the terms climat and canton and cru in that respect. But terroir was, was used a great deal. <coughs> Excuse me. In the 19th century, terroir was totally reinvented. I was thinking of making this presentation only about the 19th century, but instead I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on it. You had an ever greater level of detail, an ever greater level of precision in marking out where wines came from, in identifying terroir. So maps such as this were drawn up in uh, 1861, where the names of almost all the vineyards on the Cote d'Or section of Burgundy were painstakingly inscribed by hand and included in a coloured system of classification. So in this map, the areas labelled pink, which are the lower slopes of the hillsides there, are considered the best. 
yellow second best, and so on. You have a gastronomic map drawn in the 1850s under the aegis of Napoleon III at a time when Paris was dazzling with a new opera house, with new boulevards. And it's interesting because not only does it show the food and wine that we saw in previous gastronomic maps and which we've seen in gastronomic maps ever since, but for the first time it shows the railways which connect the various agricultural regions of France to Paris. This is important for two reasons, at least two reasons, but one is it allowed for effective agricultural specialization within the country. So instead of having to worry, to worry about growing enough food for yourself, you could grow what you were good at or what the land was good for or what a reputation had been established for and you could buy everything else. So food and, food and wine is getting shipped to Paris and there's, an, there's a very nice uh, uh, illustration in the margins of this map, which shows a banquet in Paris, in dazzling Paris where the bourgeoisie, the middle classes, are exploding in numbers, they hold the reins of power, they have the money to pay for wine, and above all they want to know about wine, they want to know where do the best wines come from, and they're constantly using the idea of terroir to explain this. Something else that happens in the 19th century is that terroir goes from uh, a purely technical sense to a more figurative, metaphorical sense. People talk about it in terms of rural authenticity. They talk about it in terms of the accents of terroir. They talk about it in terms of the poems of terroir. It's no longer just the food and drink. Many people could, could drink wine. Uh, it entered the middle classes. It entered the rural working classes, the agricultural class. You had pictures such as this one, uh, which is from 1864, where one Parisian saying to another, and when you think people are drinking absinthe in a country like this which produces such good wine. So wine is in the ascendant, and quality wine above all is in the ascendant. Not just in France, further north in Europe, this is the northern tip of Denmark, where in 1888 a group of artists and their friends are cheering probably nothing more than the sun coming out with champagne. So, so wine is already a big part of, of middle-class socialising. It's no longer an elite pursuit. The final thing is that there was a big technical change in the way wine is made, and this specifically included the sense of terroir. What happened was there was a chemist in the early 19th century called Jean-Antoine Chaptal, and Chaptal realised that the wines from the different parts of France varied, amongst other things, because of the amount of sugar in them. In the north of France, the climate was less good, you had less sunshine, less sugar, less alcohol in the resulting wine. In the south, they didn't have the same problem. What he realized was, if you take a load of sugar from the Caribbean colonies and pour it into your fermenting wine, you will end up with more alcohol, you will end up with a stronger, richer product. And this innovation was considered so groundbreaking and so important for promoting the economies of wine-producing regions of France that a pamphlet explaining it was sent to every town hall in France, and Chaptal was, was fated as a national hero to the extent that his name was chiseled into the Eiffel Tower, along with some other scientific greats. So where does this get us in the 20th century? Well, you can probably start to see there's an economic imbalance. Some regions have got terroir that are particularly valuable, such as in Burgundy, such as Champagne, although that's also for other reasons, uh, and, and others aren't. And, and so on the one hand, you've got places like Merceau, the village of Merceau, which was much favoured by Thomas Jefferson, it was his favourite white wine. And here, where we've got those individually labelled vineyards, you could buy, and you still can today, a wine labelled from a particular vineyard, this is Les Gouttes d'Or. You can buy a Merceau Gouttes d'Or. So there's an extremely precise uh, connection between a wine and the, and the vineyard of origin, literally maybe a dozen vines of origin. But at the same time that's happening, elsewhere in France, you've got wine cooperatives being set up because there's so much wine being produced of perhaps average quality and not well known, that they can't get a secure price for it. So this cooperative was set up in the south of France in the village of Marosson in 1905, I think, and it makes it pretty explicit what it's all about when it says, all for one, one for all. Right? It's a cooperative. And terroir, again, was used uh, in the disputes around what's the better model, a particular place or a, a fair income for all. So in Burgundy in 1927, there was a kind of tug of war going on. On the one hand, you had villages like Moray, which renamed themselves in honour of a particular vineyard which had a great reputation. So Saint-Denis was the name of a vineyard, not a town, a vineyard. And Moray renamed itself Moray Saint-Denis to honour the vineyard and to make sure that when people wanted that wine, they came to Moray and not to a nearby village and not somewhere else. But at the same time that that happened, 
Jules Richard was elected president of the new wine cooperative in Azé, which produces the wine that you're drinking. He was elected, and at that time there was a dispute over what was called the Statut Bourguignon, which would be a kind of guide and a legally enforceable set of rules about who can use the name Burgundy in their wines. And on the one hand, people like Jules Richard, the people who were in favor of cooperatives, said that terroirs can be mixed together so that everyone benefits from a wider reputation. But on the other hand, in villages like Moray, they were like, no, because we've got individual vineyards that are valuable, and we, small number, will make money out of it. So there was a big dispute about who should win and who should lose from the concept of terroir and the names where it is a vote uh, in, in connection. And what you also have happening in the early 20th century at the national level is the system of appellation d'origine is made, which is geographic labels of origin, where they start to sort out who can use what names on, on the national scale. Where does that get us today? Well, the rhetoric of saying that a quality wine owes its quality to the place it comes from, and that we can identify those places specifically, and above all in France, and above all in Burgundy, has traveled the world, and it has sparked imitation, admiration, jealousy and rubbishing, contests. The most expensive bottle of wine ever sold went under the hammer at Christie's Auction House in New York last year. It comes from the Domaine de, de Romane Conti, which is a tiny vineyard in Burgundy. Uh, some describe it as the best red wine in the world. In this case, last year, it sold for about $550,000, one bottle. So in some ways, that's, that's the apogee of, of the terroir model. Elsewhere, though, we can see how the rhetoric and the logic of terroir, this association of product to place, is being used. So in, in California, you've got what are called AVAs, American Viticultural Areas. And there's more than a passing resemblance to the map I showed you earlier with the pink and yellow and green bands. Because what you've got here within the Californian wine-growing territories are circles within circles, small and smaller places that have been identified as having something special about them, having terroir, right? Having a set of physical and human factors which come together and year after year, or at least in most years, make a wine that has a certain character. So in California, this, this sells, right? The New Yorker ran an article last year where they explicitly talked about terroir in terms of making a truly American wine. And the aesthetics of the old world have also crossed the Atlantic and, 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 and elsewhere. This, this, this fabulous Tuscan castle isn't in Tuscany, it's in the Napa Valley in California. So I think there's a whole um, aesthetic appreciation of terroir which also helps the concept to hold water, if you like. People like the idea of having an experience of terroir and they're very ready to associate that with a particular and a particularly pretty place. Indeed, you could argue that terroir is rarely left to be, rather it has to become, it has to be staged in some way. So in the Champagne region, uh, they promote agritourism and they encourage the idea of the, the vineyard as an almost bucolic, green, uh, natural environment, uh, which can, can raise an eyebrow when you compare it to images from Champagne from the 20s, where you've got some vineyards covered in cement because it made it easier for the grape pickers uh, in muddy conditions to do their work. So it doesn't, doesn't look so pretty, doesn't look so natural. But the idea of things looking natural, and especially the idea of things looking old-fashioned, is kind of central to the way, concept, the way the concept of terroir is talked about today. Horses have made a comeback in Burgundy after an absence of two or three generations. They labor the soil, they look great when you're cycling around, they, they're used in the promotion of fine wines, and you can see them when, when you're there. Images are taken in vineyards that were planted by those medieval monks. This is the Clos de Vougeau in Bur Burgundy. This, comes, this was first planted in grapevines in the 13th century. And what I see in accounts that use terroir uh, over and over again is kind of two, two, two axes. So on the one hand, you've got geographical specificity, which is very easily communicated with a map. And then you've got a density of historical explanation. There has to be some kind of backstory. There has to be some kind of history for you to stage terroir and stage the landscape that's being seen or the product that's being sold and give it some kind of historical weight. What's interesting on this picture uh, at the bottom left, we've got a lady here bending over, um, attending to the vines. It's remarkably similar to that image from the medieval painting at Saumur. It's a woman in the same attitude and very similar dress. And so there are, this, this second image is from a photo shoot in the 60s. 
And, and I wouldn't be surprised if they, if they wanted her to look like the medieval woman, because that helped to tell the story of continuity with the vineyards of the past. But to what degree can we say that any one terroir is qualis ab incepto, the same as when it started? What's changed? Has the soil changed? The soil, I'll skip that, the soil is constantly used, as we saw in my word cloud, it's constantly used by people to understand and explain what terroir is. But as we know, changes to agricultural habits, uh, changes to the products used, the kind of things that Rachel Carson talks about in Silent Spring, the use of pesticides, the use of copper, can have material changes on the soil and the life within it. So people sometimes go deeper and they say it's the geology. It's the geology that counts, right? The Beaujolais lies on gr granite bedrock, Burgundy lies on limestone, and so on. In this advert for the wines of Alsace, on the Fran Franco-German border, they say that the geology gives a pure expression of terroir. When you're drinking the variety of wines from Alsace, one of the things you're tasting is the geology, which varies within the region. But some critics have said it doesn't make sense uh, because there are, there are areas with a certain uh, ge uh, bedrock which make great wines and other areas on the same bedrock that don't. Um, and also the language that's used around a wine having a mineral taste or a chalky taste or a flinty taste is a bit of a hiding to nothing because those things don't taste of anything. We don't taste rock, they don't taste of anything, with very few exceptions. But somehow it's powerful in the imagination, it's powerful as an explanatory vari variable. If you say it's the geology that's behind this, it's difficult to imitate if you're somewhere else in the world. It's difficult to say, we're growing the same grapes, we're using the same methods, but the geology is different. So some see it as a, as a form of protectionism. Roger Dion, who was a French historian and geographer, he wrote a book in the 50s about the history of French wine. He said it well when he said that the physical factors of terroir, the physical reasons that a wine attains a reputation and has a certain value and is widely appreciated, are always subsumed by the human factors. They're always subsumed by what Adam Smith talks about, that any production needs to be aimed at consumption eventually. It ignores the work that goes on, the changes that are made, the choices the producer makes. And he makes a point about Bordeaux, uh, not Burgundy, but Bordeaux. He says that Bordeaux, climatically, is not well set up for great production. It has a damp, foggy climate that rolls in from the Atlantic. But the reason it's so successful today is because of 700 years or so of protected commercial relationship with England. We know the English love wine. We also know that in the 14th century, Bordeaux belonged to England. And since that time, they've been shipping wine to the English ever since, making a name for themselves and reinvesting the profits in wine production. So for me, although terroir concerns a particular place, it only attains any surplus value if it exists in wider relation with people who want to buy it, people who are interested in it. Just briefly, some of the new frontiers of terroir also call into question how we make knowledge about it. So one of the latest uh, ideas is looking at the, the microbial level and looking at the wild yeast, the bacteria and fungi that live in the air of the vineyard, that accumulate on the, the waxy grape skins, and looking at how this varies. And I'm not going to go into detail about this impressive graph. This comes from work done in California in 2013. But what they're showing is, and I quote, non-random, place-specific variation in bacterial and fungal communities. Which is to say, in a particular vineyard, you might have different bacteria and fungi, and the geology is the same as another vineyard, so maybe that's what's, what's changing things. The problem when you get to the microbial level is you start to be interested also in what pesticides you're using because they might kill off some or all of the microbes and the, and the things you find in the soil, the, the worms and the nematodes and all this kind of stuff. That all gets called into question and that can be a little bit uncomfortable for wine producers who are using a lot of chemical pesticides and can just talk about geology which doesn't change or can just use historical reputation and not look very closely at what they're doing year in, year out. So for some organic and biodynamic producers who I've talked to, they want terroir to be remapped. They want terroir to be talked about in terms of the ecology it's built on. They want us to talk about hedgerows and the life of the soil and fungi and wild yeasts instead of geology and history books. And in fact, in a high-profile case in 2014, a biodynamic wine producer in Burgundy got slapped with a fine because he refused to spray his grapes with pesticides. And his neighbours thought this was irresponsible because a pest might spread from one vineyard to another. 
And I'm going to talk about this, by the way, at the geography department next week in particular, this sustainability question. So do, do come along to that if you like. I've tried to show you today um, some of the richness of the concept of terroir, some of the ways in which it is contested, some of the ways in which it is promoted, and the historical development of the concept. Um, I think that wine is a cultural good. And I follow Stefan Zweig when he says, when he asks, what is culture? If not the wheedling from the coarse material of life by art and love, its finest, most delicate, most subtle qualities. Wine is a cultural good. It transmits environmental stories to us. It stimulates a geographical imagination, which can be further stimulated by maps and the labels on wine bottles. And it enters into a system of images. Terroir asks us, what is a sense of place? A sense of place is used in the Europe-wide system of appellation d'origine, protected designated labels of origin. Sorry, I've forgotten the German term. But this is, this is a map I need to update. But what this basically shows, as of 2016, is the number and type of geographically protected foods, not even including wine, uh, that exist in the different European countries. And I was in Paris recently, and one of the things we were talking about was how this model of having commensurate things which have cultural and terroir-based stories to tell is a means of integrating the different countries of the European Union, about saying to them all, what are your stories? What are your products with stories? What are your agricultural and environmental histories? And let's value them with a geographical label. And even more when we think about a sense of place. Lufthansa has recently been running a life-changing places series of podcasts and videos. The most recent has a Chinese biochemist called C.C. Lee, who explains that she came to Burgundy a few years ago, she was overawed by the landscape and by the terroir, and it literally changed her life. <laughs> some, some years ago, uh, I gave a presentation on terroir, and I was asked, but isn't this all just a marketing ploy? And I hope today, um, with what we've seen and what we've tasted, that um, you'll be willing to take the plunge off the iceberg and discover some of what lies beneath. Thank you.